Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is John Fields, and I'm the Lydia Cheney and Jim Sokol Endowed Director of AVA. Um, we have four exhibitions opening tonight. We have uh, William Downs' which is right around the corner over here in the atrium. Um, yeah, sorry, I got this Zoom thing happening right here next to me, and I did, forgot to mute it. Yeah. It's a brand new computer, and I don't know how to turn off the volume. There we go. Have a good one. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah. There's this lecture that I want to watch. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, we're great. So we obviously have a really strong student representation tonight, but we're also super excited that all three of our artists are here tonight as well. One in particular who Melissa alluded to was the juror for this year's show. So I think since William is here, I think William should come up and say just a few words about his process <laughs> selecting the student work. Um, and so, you know, just we, we weren't entirely sure you were going to get here, William. <laughs> but come up right ahead. So... Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for coming out tonight. This was one of my um, toughest chores all year, but it was one of my favorite ones. It was a very, very, very intense process because there was so much good work. I can't believe it. Um, I want to give thanks to the instructors for leading their students to the promised land, I guess. <laughs> the future is going to be good with these artists, so I'm really excited about it. And it's an honor to be showing next to Lily and Sonia and the students um, all at the same time. Um, I feel like they can see a little bit of my magic and they can see how I kind of looked at their magic a little bit in terms of the figure process. I think everybody's work had a voice and I thought that everybody executed the work in a very beautiful craftsmanship. Um, I think that the, the strength that they put in the work this time, well, I didn't see the last time, but this time, dealing with the things that we've been going through in 2020, you know, a lot of people had a little bit of that mixed in their work. And I think a lot of them were thinking about the self a lot. So those are the things that I paid attention to. And I think that um, these guys are gonna be really good if they keep working. So keep working and thank you for having me. And I'll see some of you at the end of Lily's speech. Oh, you want to stick around? So we have, yes. I, I think, William, there was 108, 108 works in the show. Um, obviously, being selected to be in the show in and itself is, of course, an honor. But we do have six awards to give out. So three of which were selected personally by William and three were selected by uh, various members of the AVA staff. And so... Um, 
I think well, we're going to announce the we're going to announce the winners, and then everyone that is announced will get an email either I think later tonight or on Monday with instructions for how to uh, get your payment because these are cash awards. I think the first place is a two hundred dollar award, and all the other awards are hundred dollars. So um, I'm just going to let you do the honors. Sure. Okay. Um, we'll start with close to the microphone. Please. Yes. <laughs> We'll start with um, the third place winner, and I apologize if I screw your name up in advance. <laughs> um, Karina Ortwitz. Um, Ortiz, I Ortiz, think. Ortiz, sorry, yeah. Ortiz. <laughs> and then Matthew Davis. Yeah. Place goes to Caitlin Avery. Really beautiful, really beautiful. And then the next three, so we have the Ava Directors Award, which was personally uh, selected by me. Um, and that goes to Maddie Manston. And then we have the Ava Curators Award, which was uh, selected by Ava's assistant curator, Tina Ruggieri. And that goes to Angel Levesque. And then, and then we did something we've never done before this year where we actually decided to do an Ava Staff Award. And so all six of my staff actually had to kind of come in the gallery and somehow managed to, to land on one piece that we all sort of equally liked. And so it was actually kind of a, also a great team building exercise for us. But um, that award goes to um, Ish. So, um, you know, we have a really packed evening tonight, so I'm going to keep this moving along. And so we're honored to have all three artists and students in attendance. For those of you who are watching remotely from home, um, we are, you know, we are broadcasting this live via Zoom at the moment too. So um, Tina is monitoring the, the Zoom account. So if you have any questions for Lily after her lecture, you're welcome to pop those into the chat. But um, I'm going to now introduce tonight's speaker. Oh, real quick too, before, I also wanted to remind everyone that there is a separate exhibition up the street in the art department's art lab, the Salon des Refuse. So I encourage you before you leave, if you haven't been there already tonight, I would I would walk up. It's just about half a block up the street and check out those works there. So born in Birmingham, Alabama, Lily Reeves currently lives and works in Phoenix, Arizona. She earned her BFA from Alfred University in 2015 and her MFA from Arizona State University, Phoenix, Arizona in 2018. In 2019, Reeves was awarded the Nova Emerging Artists Award from the Fresco Foundation and the SAXE Emerging Artist Fellowship from the Glass Art Society. She has exhibited at museums and galleries such as Phoenix Center for Contemporary Art, Urban Glass, ASU Art Museum, Houston Center for Contemporary Craft, Museum of Neon Art, and Loveland Museum of Art. She's an artist we have been very fond of for many years now here at AVA, and we're super thrilled that she's finally here in our galleries. And so now I'm gonna just hand it over to Lily Reese. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, John and Tina and everyone here has been so amazing um, helping me helping me set this show up. And it's so wonderful to be here in Birmingham and to share um, my work with the place that you know I call home. Um, I'm gonna start a timer on my phone real quick so I don't bore you guys for too long. <laughs> uh, let's see. All right, so um, I've always been, um, I'm just going to talk to you guys a little bit about my, my whole practice and some about the works that are in the show, too. Um, I've always been interested in exploring the metaphysical in my work, um, these magic, invisible worlds that are sewn into the fabric of the physical material world. Um, and these spiritual and emotional and psychological lives that take place within our bodies has always been super fascinating to me. Um, without these, you know, things that are happening inside of us, we're really just like walking skeletons. And that's like kind of terrifying to me. Um, and 
Being from Alabama, my visual language has always been super influenced by the supernatural and the magical qualities of the South. I borrow a lot of visual language from the theater of religion um, and the spectacle of evangelism. Uh, I'm interested in performance as a tool for real psychological transformation. Um, and this is an idea that's common in a lot of ritualistic practices. Um, and these are found in almost every religion from baptisms to bar mitzvahs. Um, in this piece that you guys are seeing, uh, Reverse Baptism for the Mississippi, a friend and a fantastic artist and collaborator, Jess Hirsch and I, boiled Mississippi River water at the headwaters of the Mississippi. And people were invited to bathe in a bath of warm, clean river water. Um, this was an act of love and of death and rebirth for um, the waters of the Mississippi. And this is a river that has been polluted so badly that uh, we can't swim or fish in it anymore. So very quickly, I understood the power that these performances hold um, and the necessity for not just myself, um, but for many people to be able to experience a more nuanced approach uh, to look inward at these spiritual and psychological worlds that are inside of us every day that are always there that we kind of have a tendency to ignore. I also, you know, w fell in love with the desert. Um, moving out west, I, I currently live and work in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and in grad school, um, I collaborated a lot with different artists, and one of my longtime collaborators, Krista Davis, who's in this show, um, we call ourselves the Paradise Boys. <laughs> uh, we began to use performance as a way to connect with the landscape, um, and we started filming things in national parks and monuments and in public lands across the country. And, you know, this is one of the reasons why the West Coast seems so large and expansive, and that's because of all the public land out there. Um, I'm just going to mute this. So one thing that is a little frustrating to me about a lot of land art, um, contemporary land art, is uh, the fact that, you know, people who are making work out, out West um, don't often recognize the politicization of land in America. Uh, the land and the environment are also bodies. Uh, an ecosystem, you know, is more than a backdrop or a canvas on which to dig holes and pile dirt and make marks on the earth. Um, so the Paradise Boys, you know, work to decenter the human experience in the landscape and to call attention to the freedom um, and the paradise that nature provides unconditionally for us. So we're interested in the political framework of public land and how subversively it can offer a queer alternative uh, to rigid societal norms. Nature is super gay. So this video is from when the Trump administration conducted the National Monument Review of 2017, um, which reduced the size of Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, which is one of the largest wild spaces in the contiguous 48 states. And he reduced it by 50% in size, selling off a lot of acreage for uh, extraction leases of oil and natural resources. Um, he got rid of a bunch of other national uh, you know, monuments as well. Um, and thankfully, the Biden administration has since reversed this order um, and restored Bears, e Bears Ears and Grand Escalante um, with the help and recommendations of local tribes. Um, so this piece is titled Last Dance because we're thinking of the moment when you're at a concert or like a club and the DJ is like, this is the last dance. And, you know, you get really sad, but then you give it everything you have and you just dance, you know, as hard as you can before the lights come on and the magic is gone. And we thought what we had was one last dance with Grand Staircase. And thankfully, you know, it, it wasn't, and it's still there for future generations, but we made this really fun kind of music video <laughs> about it. Um, and the sound too, which I'm not playing, was collected on site um, too from, uh, from sounds that we sort of collected around the park. 
Um, so this is also a Paradise Boys uh, video sculpture. And this piece is in my show here in Gallery 2, um, which is titled Between Futures. And I called it, you know, I, I named this show that because I feel like we're at a precipice at this point in time. Um, and really, you know, we can always be, we can always create any world um, that we want and the possibilities are just endless. And yet we keep collectively making the shittiest possible decision, decisions <laughs> uh, over and over again. And, I, you know, I just, I, I want people to think about this idea um, that we could be lounging, you know, by the river eating grapes and instead we have credit scores and privatized land and fences and borders that we can't cross without pictures of ourselves that are legitimized by the government. It's really weird when you think about it. <laughs> um, so this piece, this video sculpture is a, a mythological story that Krista and I made up. And it's about a person, this myth mythological mer person, if you will, uh, who travels the world through bodies of water. And this water spirit person can absorb heat in their body. And everywhere that they go, the heat is stored inside of them and the ice regrows and this magical ethereal being restores balance to a dying world. Uh, I graduated with my master's in, uh, from Arizona State University in Phoenix, and this was a part of my thesis exhibition, um, which explored this idea of healing our relationships, uh, not just to ourselves and to our bodies, but to each other and to the world. Um, because I feel like contemporary life is, you know, a little overwhelming, and I think capitalism is slowly kind of tormenting everyone. Um, whether or not it's sort of in our peripheral or. So this is another piece from that exhibition and it's called Revival after a Southern Tent Revival, which is a phenomenon here in the South. Um, and this piece, instead of walking to this like, you know, evangelist sermon, you walk into a ceremony space um, that's lined with this kind of fresh smelling grass and you experience a sound and floral bath um, that's facilitated by a friend of mine and a magnificent you know, healer, uh, Maga. There, she's in blue. Um, and she sings to you and she sprinkles you with like herbal infused water. And uh, the water uses plant-based healing to evoke feelings of euphoria. Um, so there's like oils and flowers and stuff in the water to stimulate your brain and your nervous system. Um, and after, after my thesis, I went to the desert <laughs> for a while, um, and I sort of stayed in this really isolated state, um, making these really fun, beautiful, I had a residency program um, at the Tokush Institute, and um, I was just making this really fun art without structure, and, you know, just really letting go. And I think sometimes that's very important in, in an artist's practice, um, just to make, have fun, you know, and not think so much. And these, I think, were some of the more beautiful pieces that I've made. Um, and I was really thinking a lot about collaborating with the landscape as sort of an active participant in the work. Um, so these were temporary installations that came alive with the changing light of the sunrise and the sunsets. And there's something really special, um, you know, about being outside and, and listening with more than your eyes and your ears and nature. And these kind of spaces, you know, don't need language all the time and they don't need theory. Um, and it doesn't mean that it means any less or you understand it any less um, because of that. So I also <laughs> run a business <laughs> out of my studio, an art and design firm in Phoenix. And uh, these are some of the pieces. This piece is in Atlanta actually. Um, but I just wanted to show you guys some of that work because I spend so much time doing it. <laughs> and uh, when I'm not, you know, making conceptual work, I'm, I'm making, you know, things that brighten people's everyday experiences in a space. Um, 
There's also pieces that blur the line between art and design. And I think that's okay. Um, I don't think we have to take ourselves so seriously all of the time. And this installation I made for my sister's wedding in New Mexico. Um, and these windows were salvaged out of an old church here in Alabama. And, you know, I always was just making this from like a design standpoint. And then I had this conversation at the wedding and um, someone was like, wow, like these, you know, windows mark this iconic, like sacred space. And at one point that sacred space was the inside of a church. And, you know, then when you move them out here and you let them in the sunset behind the windows, the landscape sort of moved in and became the sacred space. Um, and that's what supported and held the ceremony. And I thought that was so beautiful. <laughs> uh, so I named this installation Church of Sky after um, that conversation. And then I was like, okay, maybe this is art. I don't, I don't know. And I don't think that it matters, you know. Um, so this is some of the work that's in the exhibition in the next room that you'll see. Um, and this is a lifelong body of work that I started uh, here in Alabama. I think, I guess that says 2020. Um, <laughs> like, when did I make this? Um, so these signs are, uh, you know, this body of work is called Signs of Change. Um, they're literal signs. And they're portraits of uh, endangered or extinct species in neon light. Um, and all of the species are habitants of North America. Um, and the three in this show in particular are from the geographical region of the Southeastern United States. Um, this one is an Alabama rainbow snake and it's photographed in the wild um, here in sort of the outskirts of Birmingham where it's been displaced by humans. Um, and they're kind of meant to be these like miraculous visions in the landscape, which was how I imagined them. But I also just really love them as objects. Um, the, so just the rainbow snakes are found uh, in Blackwater Creeks, which is a swamp fed creek, which is found here in the Southeast, but also, you know, the only other place that it's found is in um, the Amazon rainforest of South America. Um, so, and they live, you know, next to these swamps and, marsh and marshes and wetlands, which are super important to the health of freshwater systems um, here in the South. Um, so draining the swamp is actually like really bad for our water security in the future. Don't do it. <laughs> uh, and someone asked me once, uh, you know, how these portraits would be relevant to people outside of the biological region where they're from. Um, and that really struck me, you know, because I think it shows how little we think about um, our lives as connected to the natural world and specifically how little we think of non-human life. Uh, human life and welfare is absolutely dependent on the existence of non-human life. Um, the long-eared bat, for example, uh, provides $3 billion annually, annually, according to the Fish and Wildlife Service, because they fly around at night eating the bugs that are attacking our crops. Um, so the loss of biodiversity um, is going to be one of the worst problems that we face in, uh, you know, in the on, sort of onset of climate change. Um, it's going to be worse than, uh, than weather, you know, changing weather, than, than climate migration, because it's so understudied and we don't really know the repercussions that um, species collapse will have on our sort of style of life. Um, I also wanted to make these signs in a super traditional canon of neon signage, um, because it's how we usually experience neon um, in the world. And, you know, we experience neon in the world as a tool for capitalism most of the time. Um, and so I thought it was kind of ironic making them out of neon. It's like advertising, but for the end of the world or whatever. Um, so this piece is also in the exhibition and it's another collaboration. I collaborate a lot um, with other artists and um, this was made uh, with a video artist, Lucia Raffel. And we created this installation when COVID hit in 2020. Um, and this piece explores the idea of reality. Um, 
the Trump administration at the time was putting out, you know, all of these campaigns and um, people were calling it misinformation. And there was this really confusing atmosphere of what is real and what was not. Um, and so we wanted to build a space that played on this idea of questioning reality. Um, in this case, blurring the lines between the digital and the physical world. But we also, you know, wanted to highlight our role as artists in creating realities and presenting potential alternatives um, with this idea of building worlds. I think mirrors too have always been used as a metaphor for the infinite. Um, so these next few slides um, are portraits that I took while organizing alongside Apache Stronghold um, in Arizona. And Apache Stronghold is a cultural group that works to preserve uh, traditional spiritual and cultural practices um, and tribal sovereignty in Arizona. And before I play this interview of Dr. Wenzler, I want to play both uh, interviews for you guys, um, which is like around 12 minutes total. Um, but I want to give you guys some context um, around the movement to save Oak Flat and the kind of larger picture that it embodies. Um, this work came out of sort of uh, organizing, you know, with this group. And for me, it's really important to talk about my own identity politics when presenting this work. Um, having been raised as a, mid, you know, middle class white woman from the South, um, I care very deeply for the land and the water um, and all of the wildlife that cohabitates our world, if you can't tell. <laughs> Uh, you know, having been raised by two environmentalists. Um, but it's important for me to present this work in a way that does not take ownership over this story. Um, this is not my story. I'm an outsider. Um, and this work is also not about me. Um, but it's really important to point out that this story also needs to be told. I mean... You know, why, why is it that we can imagine the end of the world, an apocalypse that has been fetishized, um, that has been told from every possible angle, but we cannot imagine the end of capitalism, the end of colonialism or imperialism. Currently, Apache Stronghold's main objective is to save their traditional homelands, an area uh, in Arizona, east of Phoenix, called Oak Flat, uh, from complete destruction. Um, by what is planned to be North America's largest copper mine. Uh, the Apache people thrived in this area for thousands of years um, before the Indian, uh, sorry, before the Indian Removal Act of 1830, signed by uh, Andrew Jackson, um, which established reservations in America. Um, this forcibly evicted Native people from their traditional homelands onto prisoner of war camps, which are modern day reservations. Um, this also just a side note, uh, coupled with the missionary boarding schools and the laws that made practicing traditional ceremony illegal until 1978, um, all of this has been classified as categorically genocidal by the United Nations. And it's really vital here to point out um, that, you know, we all read historical accounts and literature written by non-white scholars um, to avoid the fictional narrative that we've sort of all been raised believing um, about the foundations of our country. Anyway, uh, Oak Flat is in danger of being completely destroyed um, at the hands of this mining company and at the mismanagement of the United States government. Um, so in 2014, President Obama signed this national defense spending bill and um, there was this clause in it, which was sort of added super last minute, um, which legalized a land transfer uh, between the United States government and BHP uh, built, built in um, for this land exchange that traded basically thousands of acreage, including Oak Flat, for other land to be sort of given to the patronage of the of the United States government. It was a land swap, um, and so this area of land had always had legal protections put in place by President Eisenhower in the 1950s. Um, due to the natural and cultural value of Oak Flat. Um, and this natural value um, includes the state of Arizona's largest aquifer, um, which is a rare occurrence in a desert state. 
um, whose demands for water far exceed the supply of available potable water. In addition to this, Oak Flat is a sacred and holy land to um, many indigenous people in the area, including the White Mountain and San Carlos Apache. Um, Winsler Noisy and the Noisies are, are from the San Carlos um, clan. And um, so their deities or their angels, or um, they call them gone people, which you'll hear him talking about in the interview, uh, live there in the mountains to this day. Um, so this is a multifaceted problem. It's an ecological problem. It's also a cultural issue. Um, so to give you context about the sort of water issues in the Southwest, I buy my water once a month in five gallon drugs. I mean, in five gallon jugs. <laughs> um, it's, you can't drink the tap water. Like it's, you know, it's not super, it's not like a watery place, right? Um, so it's stupid. This mine is dumb. It will consume more water than a small city. Um, so I'm just going to play this interview for you guys. Um, and I would just, there's, there's no video. So it's just a listening experience. Why do you think that it, people should know about this place and sort of what's going on, 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 sort of what's going on,
that these sacred and, and sacred and holy places have a meaningful meaning to them. What America said is that if you're a Christian and have a Bible that represents if you're a king, then those are your sacred and holy places there. Mm -hmm. Not here. And that you're uh so, I mean, that, that clearly shows that the United States wants to stay as a corporate country because if they would recognize and stand with them, there would be a lot more white people standing with us because there's a lot more people, not just white people, Mexican people, black people who have a spirit, spiritual encounter here but are not allowed to stay. stay, stay. And to me, that that is an issue that all Americans need to discuss, need to come to the forefront of it and say, is that true or not? Because what of how America, the foundation of where it started from, does that still hold water for this generation to say that all these places in America is not holy to you are from Europe? And so it's funny, you know, when you see them arguing, like today when you see the political arguments and people are yelling and screaming that this is our country, it's our land, it's not all the immigrants, but their own system made them the religious experience of what's holy here, because then you're considered true. And I think that this journey has opened a lot of doors and that we all have to fight. And that's what I want them to know about Oak Flats. Is that Oak Flats has opened the door to all of their friends. system has denied them to be rooted. I listen. To be rooted. When people say that this is our country, this is our home. And why the system look at it in that way? Because the white people can't stand with me here on the religious position. They can stand with me on the policy position, but not on the religious issue. And yet, mm -hmm. these people have had religious experience here. Mm -hmm. They can't claim it. So to me, that's, you know, that's, that's, a, that's an argument that that's why I say that it's, if you hear me say my interviews, that it's not, it's not an Apache fight anymore. It's an American issue. It's this, this old fight has really opened the doors of how hypocritical this country is. And yet, America has called the religion Christianity close to the fights. If I can say anything to you, that you know, and it's out there listening, is you have to look at yourself. You, you, know, you have to understand yourself. You have to understand this country. And you have to like, at least listen to us. us, 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 us. Um, so Wenzler is one of the most interesting people I've ever been around. Uh, and, you know, my friends that, uh, I want to show you guys another set of portraits that I did. Um, my friends that are on the front lines of these environmental movements, um, not just in Arizona, but um, across the country and the world from Line 3 in Minnesota to um Mauna Kea in Hawaii to Brazil, where indigenous people are literally fighting for the life of the rainforest. Uh, this is happening everywhere right now. Um, and uh, these portraits and interviews are meant to highlight this indigenous resistance and indigenous leadership um, and future building as well, um, which is something that we need desperately right now. Um, so this is a portrait that I did uh, of uh, Leanne Bighorse and Soleil de Avignon. 
And um, when I was organizing with this group, Leanne told me a story about her daughter um, who wanted to have her coming of age ceremony at Oak Flat. Um, and her daughter is 10. Um, so in the sort of like subsequent three or four years um, where her daughter would have come of age to have the ceremony, the mind would have disrupted that um, process and made it impossible because it would be a two mile deep crater in the earth. Um, so this ceremony is four days long um, and it's a combination of spiritual and physical uh, tests that the whole community shows up for. And it's really beautiful. Um, and it's been passed down for hundreds of generations in this place um, and has been practiced in this place. Um, and, you know, I think for me, uh, something that I realized in this work was that the destruction of nature is existential. Um, it's spiritual and it's wrong, simply put. Um, and we need to pay attention, you know, um, and listen and participate actively um, in indigenous stories of the future. Um, because these stories are about our collective survival on this earth. Um, and, you know, they're stories of how our culture of consumption is throwing off the natural balance of the world. Um, and we're destroying our own paradise. So I'm going to play Leanne's interview. Let me change the audio for that because it's really bad. Out on the land, and you come out and you experience just how it is to be here. If you've ever spent the night here, you can hear the coyotes, and you can hear all the animals that come out. This is their home. So we need to make sure that we respect that, not just for us as human beings to to use up all the resources of the land. It's, it's to make sure that we sustain what we have left for future generations. It's vital for our culture and our religious practices. I have one daughter and I have two sons. Brought them here since they were young, since they were born. And so they know this area. My daughter, she's she's 10 years old. She's going to be a woman soon. As a mother, it's my duty to make sure that she's physically, mentally, and spiritually ready to come It's vital that I share, you know, our culture and our, our spirituality with our children so they can pass it on. If we lose, you know, places like this, our sacred and our holy places, it's just, it, it's like a memory, like it didn't happen, like it didn't exist. It, it, it creates a disconnection between the land and who we are as people. Um, so, currently, um, you know, they recently had a, a Supreme Court hearing um, and they're awaiting the decision of that Supreme Court hearing, um, which is the most kind of current um, sort of news surrounding that site. Um, but there's, again, you know, sites like this all over the country, and it's really important that we pay attention to what's happening in these places. Um, and so that brings me to the last piece that I'm showing y'all today, um, which is also in this exhibition, although it's a different iteration um, of this installation, um, and this piece is called Room to Breathe, uh, and it's a collaborative piece by myself and my friends and my family, um, namely Josephine Ortiz, who created the video, uh, and Phoenix-based uh, uh, artist uh, Peely, who does a lot of the sound work um, with me, and she created the soundtrack. And my partner, Miguel, and my brother-in-law, Quinn, also are in the video <laughs> um, and contributed greatly to this piece. Uh, let me see, I lost my mouse. Oh, here we go. So uh, in the beginning of quarantine in 2020, my partner and I, Miguel, got really into um, this breathing exercise called the Wim Hof Method. And I think like a lot of people, we were dealing with overwhelming stress and anxiety um, in the face of these like very unprecedented times. And it was, you know, this global pandemic was coupled at the time with a lot of political unrest um, and the sort of reckoning of racial justice movements. Um, and 
it was just a lot and it was horrible and still is. Um, but we were using this meditation as a way to cope with what felt like a very out of control situation. And, um, you know, we felt very small and incapable in the face of these huge systemic issues. Um, and we felt like it was impossible for us to make a difference. Um, and something that Winsler had said um, during our interviews really reverberated with me at this time. And that was, you know, that in order to accomplish these changes that we want to see, we have to first sort of do the work inside of ourselves um, so that we can come together in, an, in a mutual understanding. And I think he called it a, a personal a personal journey to sacred unity was what he he was um, saying in his words, but that really struck with me. Um, and so when I was invited um, to create this uh, opportunity for this installation um, at the Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Art in uh, Arizona, I knew immediately that I wanted to share this tool of breath work um, that I was learning at the time. And to me, it felt very relevant at a time when a viral respiratory infection was politicizing breathing. Um, so this piece is a 17 minute guided um, meditation and it's presented as a light and sound bath. Um, in the gallery, it's the piece at the sort of very back of the wall. Um, and it's made for individuals um, to participate in this um, Wim Hof method of breathing, which is focused hyperventilation. Uh, focused hyperventilation. Um, breathing is one of the oldest tools used in meditation and in prayer. Um, Buddhist chanting is a form of breathing meditation, singing hymns um, or um, repetitive prayers um, are forms of breathing meditations. And um, it's, you know, breathing is, a, it's also a foundation for many yoga practices and it's very old and it's found everywhere and it works. Um, and while this practice in particular was, um, you know, formulated for cold exposure therapy. Um, it also allows you to access these like usually autonomous um, physiological systems in our body, um, like our heart rate. Um, and it works incredibly well as a sort of reset button and for stress and anxiety management. Um, it's also been proven to do a wonder of other things for your health. Um, you know, it, it helps with digestion. Um, it increases your energy and your sort of mental presence in your body. Um, all kinds of things, uh, you know, that benefit your health. Um, and so that, you know, I really wanted to offer this meditation as a sort of optional tool um, for people to share, you know, with you all this moment of kind of introspection um, to help you kind of how it helped me move through the world um, in a more, um, you know, in a way that sort of reflects the best possible version of yourself. Um, so. Yeah, thank you guys so much <laughs> for showing up. <laughs> um, for listening, and I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions if you guys have them. I saw someone over here. No? Okay. Natalie? <laughs> oh, that's a great question. I, um, I love collaboration. I think it's very important um, to work with other artists as much as you can. Um, you know, it's really, I think this idea of the like individual sort of genius, whatever, I think that that is like a way dead idea from hundreds of years ago, you know? And I, I, I think collaboration like really just like it adds vitality into my practice I think a lot of times artists are like working alone in the studio and it's really nice to sort of explore things with other people um, and yeah it's like a band too it's kind of fun <laughs>
Yes. Or downs, you want to go? Yeah, yes. go ahead. So when you're making your collaborations or independently, what comes first? The neon, the video, the sound? Like, how do you craft all those things together? Which one do you start with? Mm. Gosh, I don't know. I feel like it's different every time. I think, um, I think usually I sort of, if I'm focusing in on the idea, you know, I, I really just think about what it needs to come across and I find ways to do it. Um, because, and I think that's why I love collaboration all the time because I can't do everything myself all the time. Um, and so bringing people in to help with the soundtrack or, um, you know, to give another perspective. I mean, e you know, each artist has this own vocabulary and this own vernacular of all of the theory that, you know, everything that they've done and read and experienced and as, as who they are. And um, yeah, I think it's this, you know, it's the same way with each project. It's like you, you sort of just one bite at a time, you know, it's like the only way to eat an elephant. I feel like I've used that <laughs> this week. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> Nina, do you have any questions on the virtual? Cool. Well, thank you guys so much. So, thank you, John and Tina, too. I just wanted to real quick, just one more thanks and round of applause for the students, William, Sonia, and Lily. And so we'll actually have Sonia back here next month for a lecture in the exact same spot. So I encourage you to check out our social media for those dates. And then as Lily talked about in her lecture, there is a performative component to her work. And so when, when March rolls around, Lily will come back to us and actually perform. Um, it'll be a very special performance, uh, a one-on-one -on -one performance. And so there'll be very, very limited uh, viewing spots available. So I would also just check out Ava's social media for details on how to register for those.